This is WOMMLP operating out of Burlington, Vermont, 105.9 The Radiator. Good evening, it's The Rocket Shop again. I am your host, Tom Proctor, and with me tonight is Ivor May. Hello. Hello. Uh, how's things going today? Uh, I was saying earlier, today is a uh, scribble day. My brain's a little melted, but uh, overall, things are good. Things are really good. I would love to dig into a little bit more about what Scribble Day means uh, yeah, in a little bit. Yeah, I would love to explain it, yeah. Um, <laughs> we love to kick, kick it off with the song, so yeah. what have you got with it for us to start us off with? Um, I'm going to play a song called Nope, which is the first song that's on the record I just put out. Those answers that I don't possess In your inability to dig deeper And deeper and deeper into this mess And who I might really be Is a indicative of your defiance Of what others all try to ask of you Sorry, I'm confused, but I can't change the truth. I can't change the truth. All right, I feel better now. Smoke settled. Fresh breath of smoke and a sip of my tears You think I learned after all these years There's no learn to contain Just a state of a mind That love and loss fight to maintain And I don't know if my mother was right In the end, are we all just destined to die? And that's the truth change the truth I can change the truth Traffic jam is on my brain, smoke clear like misty summer rain. I burn one down to shake one up on a highway lane. It's like you never even came. Beautiful way to start the uh, start the show off. Thank <laughs> you so much. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, this new album that you put out. Because um, from what I read, it's uh, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a long slog. It's been a it's been a bit of a process from start to finish. Uh-huh. Do you want to tell, <laughs> tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, it's funny because I've definitely like 
Well, I was on here last before the pandemic. Maybe it was like 2019 or something. And it was like, when's the album coming? Let's talk about this album. It's been a huge process. And now it's like, oh, I have it. It's here. It's there. Y'all can actually go listen to it now. Um, I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's like, it's the trippiest experience ever because I started working on it almost five years ago at this point. And um, I'm a different person than when I wrote it. I never thought I was going to ever finish it. Um, but it's just like weird to finally come when something when like working on something just becomes your existence. And then all of a sudden you like, I don't, I also don't finish projects clearly. Um, so when I actually finish a project, it like feels monumental, I guess. I don't know. I'm, I don't know which direction to go in to talk about it, so maybe you should just ask me another question. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, for someone who doesn't finish a project, it seems like this one's been done, and uh, it seems like it was a labor of love. One thing I'm quite curious about is uh, something you just touched on there. When you first started writing this and putting this together five years ago, mm -hmm. you were a different person, different relationships. Yeah. Uh, the, a lot of the lyrics you write in this are very personal, obviously about some real people in some places where you were at that time and you are now, I'm assuming, kind of putting it out into the world and it's, it might not be you. So um, how did it feel as you, maybe you're getting towards the end of the project, looking back to the start of the project and, and how did you, you turn this record into something that really reflects, reflects you now, even though so much of it was made uh, in, in the, the before time? Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's funny you ask that because I've actually had a thought recently as I was finishing it and putting it out and just reflecting on this exact thing about like, okay, where was I at? Like, I wrote these songs so long ago and where am I at now and how do I feel? And I feel like I, I was a different person when I wrote them, but it's like throughout the whole process, I think more the meaning of the song has not changed, but it's evolved to mean something else. I mean, when we all listen to music and we all have favorite songs that we love and we identify with them. We all that song where you're like, somebody wrote that about me. And I think that's what is so beautiful about music is that it's really fluid in its identity and its meaning that it can sort of shape shift. Um, so on one hand, there's this, there's like the, the nature of music that we, we, we find meaning in whatever we are processing in our own lives in that moment. So meaning is created by where our brains are at. But also there's, um, I think there's a piece of, there's something that happens when you're writing. Like, at least for me personally, it's therapeutic. So I'm processing things that I don't fully understand or can't articulate at the moment. So I think I was expressing something that I grew into. Um, and at the time, a lot of times when I, when I was writing, I was writing from a place of feeling without, feeling... Um, lost, feeling sad, feeling frustrated at myself. And then now the songs are more of like a celebration. Like Nope was kind of like, I wrote that out of like, I can't change the truth. I can't change who you are. You're a child. You're a like, you do, cannot support me. And, and then now it's sort of like this celebration where it's like, I can't change the truth. I can't fit change who I am. I can't change who you are. So like moving on and I don't need you, you know, it, it's, it's, there's like, there's a celebratory quality to, to a lot of the songs now. Um, yeah. How does that feel in terms of performing? And I know it must be kind of maybe a weird question because there's such a large gap where no one was doing any performing. Is there any songs that you kind of put out there pre pandemic? I know you did the very large tour just before you were, um, before yeah. before lockdown, is there any songs that you sing you sang on that tour that maybe were difficult, or uh, something maybe you wanted to try and avoid, but you know it was a good song, so you're going to mm. put it out there anyway? That you now sing uh, to an audience and and really kind of feel it, and maybe it's now going to be the encore song or the opening song. Mm. Wow. <sighs> to be honest, it's kind of the opposite. Like I think I'm getting now that the record's out there, there's at least one song that I would play from time to time and felt really cathartic playing that I don't want to play ever again. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm done. It's out. I processed it. I made the video. I wrote the song. Um, and it's like, 
it's weird because usually as like time goes on, certain experiences get less painful. But this, for for some reason, what this like particular one is is like it still feels really tender, and I don't want to play it anymore. Um, I think the only thing that I that I notice differently is like, which is true when you're growing as an artist and a performer, anyways. Is I just like. Even though I didn't play shows in the last year, I think I like really grounded and spent a lot of time with myself that I just have this new found sort of confidence and ownership of my art that I never had before. Uh, I think there's also a level of like not giving an F. Um, can I Th say that? Thank you for saying just F. I okay, appreciate that's, that. that's radio safe. <laughs> that's radio, radio safe. Radio safe? Yeah. Yes. Um, Sorry, I have a potty mouth, so. You wouldn't be the first any, person any to come way on I here can and swear. swear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that combined with, like, feeling really confident in, like, my, who I am and then, like, not taking myself seriously anymore has just made, like, playing any of these songs more fun, I guess. Um, how much of that is natural growth? How much of that was the pandemic? How much of that was the process of putting out an album mm. over the span of five years? 33, 33, 33, point three, you know, it's like, I would say it's a third, seriously. I, I mean, I, I think I started going to therapy like three years ago and up until this past year, I like just felt like I was just ripped open so many things and didn't fully process it. And now I like worked through that and the pandemic helped me solidify who I am because everything was taken away. So I wasn't distracted by the hustle. I'm a workaholic and I just don't stop to process and think about what I'm doing and who I am. And I just get caught up in just needing to finish my to-do list or whatever project I'm working on. And so I think the combination of like doing a bunch of work and then having a year to sort of sit back and reflect, especially after like finishing a tour and getting to the end of like finishing this record. And then on top of that, finishing the record and sharing it with people and like friends and musicians who I really look up to as artists and whose opinions I really value gave back such good, like such wonderful feedback that I just felt like, Oh, Oh, I did the thing. Like you should enjoy. I don't know. I think it's just a combination of like ex experiencing gratitude. That's the other thing. Sorry. I'm tangent tangenting right now, but I was talking with friends about like that, this like collective feeling of appreciation or there's like there's some sort of even though there's a lot of bad things happening in the world I still feel like there's this like renewed love in community especially here and I think that we were all forced to experience to like to feel gratitude for our lives and we pra had to practice that all last year and that's just become we've conditioned ourselves to do that and I know that's not true for everybody but I feel like that's true for myself and like my immediate community so I think like that fits into the pandemic but like all three of those things mm -hmm. were really helpful i was actually speaking to someone today about their pandemic experience and they started i could see guilt kind of wash mm. over their face and shame wash over their face when they started talking about all the good things that they did with their roommates mm. and they were in, out in the middle of the sticks and then they were like yeah it feels it feels bad to think of the pandemic as a good thing but i yeah. genuinely had a good time and honestly i think it was a terrible experience for a lot of people but if you can get if goodness can come out of that, surely that's that's the takeaway we should be we should, we should going with. We shouldn't be feeling shameful. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel like love and positivity only creates more of that. So, I mean, it's good to acknowledge bad things in grief and support people who are grieving. But, like, yeah, I'm trying not to feel guilty. Like, I definitely was in that space of being like, I feel guilty that the pandemic was, like, the best thing that never happened to me. <laughs> but it, like, I don't know. Having a break and stepping back from everything as somebody who does who works way too much, I needed that like external something to like stop to take everything away. Yeah, so I'd love to explore that a little bit further, but I really would love to hear another song. Okay. So, yeah. what uh, what have you got for us? Let's see. What do I want to play? Um, I'm actually gonna play a new one. I know that's not what you're supposed to do when you're pushing an album, but like I said, I wrote those songs like five years ago, so I do not want to play most. We also love a big Heavy World exclusive, so <laughs> if you've not played it anywhere else yet, then we're really happy. I don't happy. think I have, actually. Um, so what's this song called? This song is called Slipping, and I um, played it yesterday with, um, with my band. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to make plugs all night because um, I'm finally doing my release show next Sunday, August 22nd at Waterworks Park, which is 
a park down at the waterfront in front of the old sailing center. Um, right on the water, sunset show. And um, anyways, we were, we were practicing this song. Um, and it sounds really good with the whole band. So that was a bad story, but it was just an excuse to advertise my show. Slipping. You could just keep playing that guitar for the rest of the night, to be honest. <laughs> I think we would all be quite happy about that. Um, so I noticed that with your album, there was a lot of influence or a lot of help or I don't know how you'd say, a lot of collaboration with yeah. some pretty decent artists around town. Uh, you're in Hackney and uh, Tom Pero, the ones that kind of come to mind. Um, especially regarding Tom Pero, a fantastic guitar player. Absolute e madman e as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't help but hear shades of him when you play like that. Is, uh, absolutely. Is, so, yeah, if is is this something that you kind of came to him with these skills and you kind of just build each other up, or is this something where he's kind of developed you, or have you actually developed him? Am I am I completely looking at this wrong way? <laughs> no, Tom is my musical guru. I would not be anywhere I am today without Tom Perro who is a phenomenal teacher and mentor and friend. And I mean, I love him absolutely to death. I like, he's literally taught me so much of what I know. I mean, from 
the Line 6 and the Topanga Reverb. Like, my pedal board is literally Tom Perum's. <laughs> um, and teaching me to be in tune with my guitar and to listen. I mean, he's such a, like, a patient, calm. I mean, yeah, Luke is here. Luke, Luke, Luke um, is sitting. For those of you listening out there, he does. Luke takes photos around town. You've definitely seen his photos. Um, and he also plays in a band with Tom Perro, but I know he also agrees with all of my sentiments that I'm saying right now. He's nodding my, his head. Um, but yeah, and just like undying support. Like since the day that I met Tom, he was my biggest fan. And having somebody believe in you when you start off and you literally have no idea what you're doing and not much self-esteem, um, like that's the best thing in the world. Um, but yeah, I think sonically too, he's just like really developed this like, this very, uh, fine tuned ear and an importance in listening more than playing. And I think I've like really taken that to heart and that's like, I'm really grateful for that lesson too. Um, yeah. What was the first thing that clicked with you and Tom? You said you kind of met him at the very beginning <laughs> of this, this mm -hmm. musical career. Mm -hmm. um, or started out as a musical hobby. Was it, was it that stage when you were kind of just, this was, you were just kind of noodling around on the guitar and he was like, this, this person's got a lot of talent and then I want to kind of cultivate that. Or was it, was it yeah. something different? I think that was probably Tom's experience. Like Tom said he heard me play and he, I mean, like fell out of his chair. He'll tell you some like crazy story. I don't remember playing for him. I must have picked it up at like a, like a, a party or something. Cause I remember we met through mutual friends. Um, but I do remember the first time we hung out because I was over, it was over at his house and I think he was living with another friend at the time, which is why I was there. And Tom was like totally vibing out doing his Tom thing and he was like cooking on the grill, making food. And when Tom cooks, Tom was in a phase where he only made little things. He only made bite sized food. So like he would make grilled vegetables, but Tom would literally like, they take the thinnest little pieces of zucchini and put them on the grill the lowest it possibly could go. And, like, I swear to God, he would flip them with, like, tweezers. And then he would cook up, like, you know, some tomato or, like, a little piece of prosciutto. And he would set out each little piece. And then he'd, like, carry the plate around and feed it to everybody. I mean, mind you, like, I'm starving because I'm assuming I'm going to go get, like, a hot dog and a hamburger. But I was also just so happy because Tom was doing that. And then he had this tape player right next to him that was playing the Staple Singers, Staple Swingers, which is one of their records. Great record. And we just completely bonded over that. And um, I was like, this guy is the coolest. I love him. And um, I think from there we just became fast friends. And I don't, I don't even know at this point, you know? It's like it's been so long ago. I remember how we met, but like when the bond became strong and where that like the musical piece was fostered, I, I, I don't even really know. He's such a wonderful Burlington character. Oh my God. We're so lucky to have him <laughs> yeah. uh, in this town. And, and he helps out so many other musicians as well. And yeah. uh, it's, it's fantastic the 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 seeds he's planted and seeing them now grow mm -hmm. um is is a wonderful thing for all of us yeah um so he he produced your album tender meat and you co-produced co-produced and you and hackney was uh did play drums he played drums and mm -hmm. he engineered um mm -hmm. the record and i would definitely say that he he like had a like producer hand in the beginning too when we were recording because he wrote all those drum parts and a lot of those songs the arrangements of those songs were formed in the studio so it felt very collaborative um but yeah he he recorded basically all the bones of everything played drums and then um tom mixed it and i added backing vocals there was a couple there was some production that i did on one or m more production that i did on one song but um yeah um and those two people, wonderful human beings, fantastic musicians, two very different personalities. How did that then affect the creation of this, this record? Mm. I wouldn't say their personalities are as different as you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think Tom's really sensitive and Uriah's really sensitive and I'm really sensitive. And I think that's like, and Dan for that matter, like we, I think we, the thing that connects us all together is that we're like sensitive individuals and like really connect I think are drawn to music for its, its vulnerability that it pulls out of people and pulls out of ourselves. So I think in creating, they're both, they're both, and Tom and Uriah are both, and Dan for that matter, because I want to give him a lot of credit for like recording the bass. And honestly, Dan has been a solid, solid, um, 
emotional support for me too throughout the whole process. But um, I think there's an openness as well. So like they're both open to try new things. They're both hunting for the right tones and the right sounds, and they're both willing to be vulnerable. Um, and I think that like that combined with like their skills was just like is sort of the the perfect storm in a studio. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and so you say you're a kind of self-confessed workaholic, came up to the pandemic, and the pandemic forced you to, to slow down and, and process and maybe look at a few things inside yourself that needed to be examined. Coming out of it now, have you gone back into workaholic mode? Have you, have you taken on 17 new projects? Have you, or is this, or is this kind of, is this changed? Is are you now a little bit slower, a little bit? Abso more absolutely not. I wish it was. <laughs> I mean, I, I was planning on it and I still have plans, but of course, like, yeah, I spent a lot of time processing throughout the pandemic. I also started a business, another business, a screen printing business. So now that like everything opened back up, it was like, oh, summer, people are coming out. Summer is happening. Shows are happening. People need screen printing. I'm releasing my record. I start a new job. I'm, it's just like, why do I? I like want to do so many things, and so I think is I think it was sort of like, it was kind of just everything happened to happen at once, because um, everything opened up and ramped back up again at the same time, and I just didn't have the foresight to think about that, and took on too much. Um, but I also lately have just also I like to be busy. This Luke, this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep bringing you to this interview. I hope it's okay. <laughs> I like I, a lot of my friends are also in the same boat. We like to, it's like, I like to do things. So I want to not overdo it and have too much on my plate. I think, I think my tolerance has like lowered. Like before I would like sleep for four hours a night and go out and work and like would never stop. Now I'm like, okay, I know I have a bunch of stuff to do, but it's seven o'clock and I really want to watch Survivor with my roommate right now. So we're going to do that. <laughs> So with Survivor was my pandemic trash team. <laughs> I okay, admittedly, I don't even like Survivor, but my roommate is obsessed with it right now and we just got a projector set up in our house. So it's on all the time and I just like happen to watch it. I'm getting sucked in. I'm I'm think I might actually apply. I'm not kidding <laughs> you. I've got I've got a friend that's a super fan and you she's like, You would be a it. great Survivor uh, cast I'm, member. There's never been with someone with a British accent, I'm just saying. That's no, already, that's, already that's a, a lie. I really? I mean out of the series that I've watched, which is like thirteen of them now in wow. the space of six months. So No British accent. I've not not heard one so far. Sounds like you got a leg up. Yeah, I think I've I've got it in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to get back to the music now. Um <laughs> So, yeah, coming out post-pandemic, obviously very, um, very busy, taking on a hell of a lot of things. But how is it in terms of coming back and performing again with, with the kind of bookend of one side being a 20-stop tour? Mm -hmm. And then what happened out the other end? Was that, was it you just, you just kind of threw yourself back into it again? Or was there like a, was there a teething process? Yeah, teething process is a really funny analogy. <laughs> Um, no, I didn't, I honestly, as things open back up, I was like, I don't really want to play shows. Like even releasing my record in June, I didn't want to play a release show then. It was too much like doing the whole release myself and thinking about like planning a show. But even so, like as every, you know, I was hesitant about things getting busy again. So I like really sort of tried to step back as much as possible. Um, and I, I just, I like, became a little more introverted over the pandemic too, or, or interested in introversion. Let's say that way, because I'm not necessarily an introverted person, but I really liked a lot of that solo time. So performing is such an outward expression. It's very energy intensive and I'm feeling much more like I want like self-preservation and I want to be, spend time with myself and create and also the people that are closest to me i don't have that desire to be hyper social around lots of people and at a show it's sort of like hi 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 who are you or hey great job hey this and i'm just, it's just like i'm overstimulated way more way easier um so but but there's still but i still have that like being in front of lights and playing into a speaker and like people listening to you and giving you their attention like that is like fulfilling as well so um the teething yeah I've been teething, and now I'm excited to play this Saturday. I open up for Ryan Montebleu at the Double E in Essex, and that's the solo set. I'm really excited to play that. And then um, next Sunday with the full band. Like, just playing a rehearsal last night was like, whoa, I totally forgot what it's like to create sound with five other people. This is wild. Um, 
Yeah. What was that first? Like, what was that first gig like? That first time you stepped back onto the stage, guitar in hand, all these records. Oh God, this is it. This is it. This is the first one. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I played um, at my friend's art opening at um, Karma Bird House, right when things started to open at the beginning of summer. But that was just like a little acoustic set. Um, so it didn't feel like my set. This is like literally the first time I'm like in a room, not by myself, performing. I f feel very honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it feels really good. It feels really good. I got a little nervous when I walked in and I was like, oh, yeah, I just forget there's always people here listening. But but now this it's nice. It's really nice. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a, a random uh, thing in terms of how many people are here. Sometimes it's just me and Bob, but obviously you are <laughs> a fairly popular artist and there's a few people Sorry. coming to watch you tonight. I appreciate it. Well, um, we shouldn't keep them waiting, so what's your next song? Um, I'm going to play... Um, so am I playing four total? Yes. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to play another one that's not on the record that I want to be on the next record that will also be played next Sunday, August 22nd, album release show. <laughs> Which, I might add, I will have all of my merchandise, tapes, CDs, and vinyl records for sale. And for any Kickstarter listeners, you can all come get your rewards at my show. Was the vinyl locally pressed? Yeah, at Burlington Record Plant. Gotta oh. give those guys a shout out. They're busting their butt right now. I hope everybody knows how hard those guys are working to press records, because everybody recorded music over the pandemic, and everybody wants records at the same time, but they're working like round the clock, and they're really um, pulling out all the stops for the local musicians, so shout out to Burlington Records. I'm fairly sure that they don't have AC in that place as well. Oh my god. Sweat box. I feel so bad for them. Well, that oh. hot vinyl just yeah. steaming out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm grateful for their labor. Okay, this song's called Honey Bee. Through, Whoa. and I'm sorry I 
So, uh, Honey Bee and Slipping were both, they're both new ones, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, tell me a little bit about the, the new songs you're creating. Mm -hmm. Is this a, 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 a new project, something you're heading towards? Is this just like, I don't want to be associated with any of the songs I've just released? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I think they're just, they're just the next progression, the next stage, you know, as a songwriter and it being like a very cathartic, therapeutic thing. It's just me, songs come out. So, I think... Um, that one was even written like three years ago. So yeah, I think I, right now I'm chilling and I'm just writing the project that I just finished and I'm in no rush. Um, I'm like ready to take a breath and I'm ready to focus on some other aspects of my life. But, um, I still, this is also why I'm busy. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm like ready to like slow down and take a breath. And then now like putting my record out and I'm playing a show. I'm like, let's get back in the studio. I want to go on tour again. I want to do all these things, but I really want to move to the woods and nest. <laughs> There's just like all of those things all at once. So, um, I think what I'm actually most excited about now, like I really like playing shows. One of the other things I, I realized about myself or sort of solidified in, in my, um, in my mind over the pandemic was that I, I like want to be so selective with shows. Like I'm not, the type of artist that wants to go out and play like 300 shows a year or like sustain myself on touring. I started a business over the pandemic because I didn't want to rely on music for money because um, it takes away the joy for it. Like I want to play to rooms like this where people are silent and they're here with me and they're present and I can create universes for folks to get lost in. So as far as shows go, I only want to play the shows that I want to play and be really selective with them. And where I would love to do what I want to just be in the studio making music with my friends um, some of the guys in the band, we were talking and I think a lot of us are excited to get back in the studio and record again. And there's other friends that I want to produce music with. And I also have like a whole slew of like my own stuff. I have like a little EP that I'm going to put out probably in the fall or winter. Um, so I'm just like, again, in that like insular in like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, introverted space where I'm feeling more about um, like creating and then sharing rather than performing. So, um, yeah, those songs are still so new that I'm just like, I'm just learning about them now. Mm. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, how long has it been since you were in the studio? Uh, when did Tend to Meet, the bulk of it, get recorded? So the bulk of it was actually recorded in January of 2018. <laughs> and um, then over the course of the three years after that, uh, it was slowly finished. I mean, I gave it to a friend to lay down some tracks. I did a couple sessions out at Tom's house to record vocals. And then even the last bits were like recorded and finished up in my bedroom, like a week before they got sent to the mastering engineer. So it was like the bones and then slowly pieced together over the course of three years. Mm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I can imagine after three and a half years, more than three and a half years now, wanting to get back into the studio. Have you got the material that you've got? Is it cohesive? Is there like a theme? Do you see how your songwriting's mm. changes or any kind of new subjects? Or is it just like, these are just a big selection of a hodgepodge of songs that I've written mm. and let's just get them recorded because we want to? Yeah, I think that's more of what it is. I think I, f I figure the meaning out of things as time goes on. Like, I don't, with my own personal music, I, I like, Tender Meat wasn't conceptual at all. It was just like, I want to record a record. Let's do it. These are the songs that I've written. These are the only songs I've written. Um, and so right now, they're just a hodgepodge of songs. And I think I just want to get into the studio and record. Like, because I did this one project, I had a vision or I, like, and I was figuring it out as I went, there was, A, I have no idea what I'm doing in the studio. I, like, think I know what I'm doing and how I'm going to record a record. Actually, I have no idea, so it's four years of learning. And now that I've done it and it's not so intimidating, I'm like, oh, let's just go and record. Like, I don't have to be so intense about it or, like, you know, 
sacred about it. And then whatever happens, when the magic happens, you grab that and you save it. And then when you have, like, I have a mass of work, then I'll figure out what to do with it. It's sort of mm. like, oh, it'll present itself to me when it's ready. So right. um, I think I think there's, stylistically, I have ideas and intentions of where I want to go. Like, I really want to develop out um, the 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 rhythm and the drums, that element of my music that I think I just didn't really understand how to communicate what I was envisioning or really had an idea of what my sound could be. Um, so that, but like, I just want to play and then whatever happens, sort of like go with that. It almost seems like while recording or while writing even, um, you're a bit too close to be able to see what the overall structure looks like you're like, you're literally in the middle of the forest and it's not until you kind of wander out and can see the whole thing that absolutely that's yeah. such a good analogy yeah yeah and that's and that's that's my process too like i don't i don't i want to write like i always say i wish i could write a happy song but like if that's not what how music exits my body it's like i don't process happy things through my music i process things that are that are difficult that are challenging um and it's it's um it's subconscious too when I'm in like that you know we've all been in like that flow state where you're not really intentionally thinking about things, and that's sort of that's like my writing process. So um, I just accept, I'm like you know what I'm not gonna write happy songs if I that so like yeah it's just sort of like you, you do it and then you step back and you're like oh okay that's what needs to happen I guess mm. so but yeah it is it is very much like the forest. But I will say it, it comes through when you play though. The you were kind of talking about earlier on about how you kind of just need to get this out because you you need to articulate it, but you don't actually have the words, and mm. so it kind of all gets combined with the, the the rest of the music, and you're really expressing this emotion you're feeling mm. in a way that just saying it just wouldn't really work. Uh, so yeah, it's what you're producing definitely. I feel it resonates. I mean, at least with me, mm. on a very emotional level not really maybe for the words but the, really the kind of the whole package put together cool thank you i appreciate you saying that no worries yeah. um i know you like a good plug so we've got a few more minutes left um tell us again what you're playing when you're playing it and where to get your record yeah so my record tender me is out everywhere you search it i have a may tender me i guarantee you there is not somebody that I guarantee you those combinations of words are not uh, that common. Um, but anyways, ivma.com, and then there's links to my band camp where you can get CDs, tapes, vinyl. Um, you can stream it. Um, and then I'm playing, finally playing my record release show next Sunday, August 22nd, 6 to 8. Lily Seabird, who has, was on here sort of recently, um, is playing with her band. She's going to open for me. And then my full band is going to play. And going to be right on at Waterworks Park, which is this park, new park that they built um, in front of the old sailing center by the Moran plant, right on Lake Champlain. We're going to play to the sunset. It's going to be great. Bring your bring your picnic blankets. Um, the city told me not to say this, but it's the park's BYOB, too, for everybody out there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, it's not really going to be a crazy party. It's going to be chill, though. It's a cheap date night, though. Yeah, bring a picnic. Bring a bottle of wine, you know. Come hang. No, bring a can of wine. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, or a box. Or a, or a box, yes. Box, a bag and a box. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's... And then and then I'm opening up um, for Ryan Montblou this Saturday at the Double E in Essex outside, which is going to be a really wonderful show. Um, I'm playing solo and Ryan's playing solo. Um there's a great brewery next door as well. Just, you know, if you can make it make Where? A, next to the double E. Oh, yeah. What's that place called? Black Flannel, I think. Black Flannel. Yeah. yeah if you like so beer. Make an afternoon of it. Yeah, exactly. You could even stay overnight and get coffee at Uncommon Ground in the morning. There we go. I don't know if they let you camp, but, you know, you could just sit in your car. <laughs> um, uh, Shut me up. <laughs> uh, any other gigs aside from that? Um, the only other thing I have on the books right now... Um, I do have something else coming up locally in September, but I'm not talking about, I'm not announcing it yet. Um, cause I want people to come to my release show and the other shows. So, um, but I am playing, I'm doing like a house show in somewhere in the Hudson Valley in New York at the end of September. 
Um, but that's it for now. Like I said, I'm picky. Yeah. And I want to just be, I want just want to live my life. Yeah. Like, which, which means people should come see these shows. Because which means you should come see these shows because I don't know when I'm playing next. Exactly. So you're, this is kind of like your chance. Um, I might quit forever. This is my farewell tour. It's now or never, guys. <laughs> uh, so what have you got to play us out with? I'm going to close out with um, uh, my fave, um, Tender Meat, which is the title track on the record. And um, my favorite song on the record. Um, and it's like the most positive song. One of the most positive ones, more positive ones I've heard. I don't know. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me. No, you're very welcome. I, the heavy world is great. I would say come back in when you uh, finish your next record, but that, <laughs> I don't know if we'll be still here by that point. I know you might not be. It might in ten years. Who knows? <laughs> um. Okay. I guess I'll play. Thanks. <laughs> The texture of his hair was in bristle Circumstance set it down Might seem rude, but I swear No one could help but stare It was easy to see that they cared On another plane, one could own Compare to a moth landing still as a stone And the painting that it shared Has a sight resting there Soft and subtle like time and water washbone
Heather May playing us out with the title track of her new album, Tender Meat. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always fun to be here. <laughs> Honestly, it feel, uh, it's a genuine honor that this was the first gig you, you did back. So Aww. thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, check her out. She's going to be playing on August 14th at the Double E and August 22nd at Waterworks Park. That's going to be a really good gig. Um, so that's all we've got time for tonight. Join us next week. We've got Bim Tyler coming in. Uh, I will not be here for the next couple of weeks, but we do have um, we do have someone taking over for the uh, time I'm away. you got to check that out. He's a really good artist. Um, but this has been 105.9 The Radiator, The Rocket Shop. I've been your host, Tom Proctor, and good night. <laughs>